Aprendimos a quererte desde la histórica altura donde el sol de tu bravura le puso cerco a la muerte. Aquí se queda la clara la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia como una que llegue para tu mano gloriosa y fuerte sobre la historia dispara cuando todo santa clara se despierta para verte aquí se queda la clara la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia comanda que llegue clara Vienes quemando la brisa con soles de primavera para plantar la bandera con la luz de tu sonrisa. Aquí se queda la clara la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia comandante llegue para tu amor revolucionario te conduce a nueva empresa donde esperan la firmeza de tu brazo libertario. Aquí se queda la clara la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia comandante llegue para Seguiremos adelante, como junto a ti seguimos y con Fidel te decimos, hasta siempre comandante. Aquí se queda la clara, la entrañable transparencia de tu querida presencia, comandante. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome. I'm joined here today by Comrade Eddie Liger Smith and Comrade Alex Zambito, um, and by our special guest, Ramiro Sebastian Funes, our brother, uh, who is a communist anti imperialist content creator and journalist and host of perhaps my favorite show on YouTube, <laughs> Unmasking Imperialism. I absolutely love it. Um, dispelling the, the spells that are cast by the wizards. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the head honcho of the wizards, the father of uh, modern propaganda, Edward Bernays. Um, so uh, welcome, Ramiro. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate 
you having me on Midwest Remarks. Shout out to everybody who's watching, listening, by the way. I love Midwest Remarks community, the people who watch and share your streams and all of you guys, of course, and everybody on the channel. I think you guys have one of the best leftist channels out there that is able to manage different personalities and people and perspectives and have political maturity, which is very hard to find on the left, even for myself, when I get into some of the topics that I talk about, some people are like, oh, my God, here we go. You know, so uh, I, I appreciate you guys having me on because I wouldn't be able to have these kind of kind of conversations on fucking Jacobin or wherever the <laughs> fuck, you know, these other whack ass uh, left, quote unquote, left uh, channels. So I appreciate you guys uh, having me on. Thank you, brother. We of share course. the same sentiment um, about your work. Um, so let's get into uh, uh, the, the the main topic of the day, Edward Bernays. Um, can you give us a little bit of a background? Because uh, I didn't know much about Edward Bernays until we went on your stream and, and we watched uh, the video that you showed us. Um, some of the stuff in the video even caught me off guard. I had a very abstract uh, knowledge of who he was. And I've, I've looked since a little bit more into him. But can you give us a, a general history before we dive into some of the more specific things that he was involved in and and some of the things that he said and how he's been able to how his ideas been able how his ideas have been able to shape uh, propaganda and the modern instruments of hegemony for for the bourgeois order. Most definitely. Thank you again. Edward Bernays is somebody who I also recently learned about and began doing research on. And he's somebody who's so fascinating. By the way, Edward Bernays his one of his relatives is one of the heads of Netflix. I would have to double check the name of the head of Netflix, but the Bernays family, which is also connected to the Freud family, they are some of the biggest magicians in the history of capitalism and imperialism. And this is something that is relevant because when you say Edward Bernays and public relations, people are like, why does that matter? You know, everybody gets their information from Netflix nowadays, their documentaries and information. If it's on Netflix, somehow it's averted. Somehow it's touting imperialism one way or another. And that's why it's important. And Edward Bernays is somebody who understands the power of media and manipulation. Uh, I just want to quickly read a quote that he mentioned. This is a, a quote from his uh, one of his works on propaganda, one of his most famous works is called Crystallizing Public Opinion. But uh, one of his other important pieces is propaganda. He actually coined the term propaganda. And this is one of his quotes, quote, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who can manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes formed, our ideas suggested, largely by men we have never heard of, Edward Bernays being one of them, right? This is a logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as a smoothly functioning society. In almost every act of our daily lives, whether in the sphere of politics or business, in our social conduct or our ethical thinking, we are dominated by the relatively small number of persons who understand the mental processes and social patterns of the masses. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind. So I wanted to kick off with that quote because before even talking about Bernays, you're going to have a lot of liberals who are like, oh my God, you guys are conspiracy theorists. You guys think everything is, is a conspiracy to control people and brainwashing. He's saying it himself. This is straight from the horse's mouth. Like He's saying in his book, Propaganda, and if you also read his book, Crystallizing Public Opinion, like we are doing mind control techniques. We are doing uh, psychoanalysis, psychotherapy. We're doing all of these different techniques that were acquired from Sigmund Freud and their family and implementing them into the realm of politics, implementing them right now, as we speak, we see a, a spell being cast on the masses in trying to support a color revolution in Iran in trying to use bourgeois feminism as a vehicle for destabilizing the Islamic revolution of Iran. So this is happening 
every day. So for this is aimed at people who think either a we're fucking crazy because you know we're conspiracy theorists or whatever. Edward Bernays tells you himself that we're doing these techniques and this is important. And B, it's relevant because it's happening now. It happened with Patria y Vida in Cuba, which was a giant spell intended to use identity politics and weaponize it for imperialism. We're seeing it happen in Iran right now. We're seeing it with Pray for Ukraine. So this is relevant and this is factual. This is not craziness. This is not anything that's out of the ordinary. So I just wanted to to preface that. Um, maybe before I get into talking about the specifics of Edward Bernays, uh, I don't know, I just pass it back to you guys. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that. Uh, I just have one little comment. Uh, I think that whole like relationship with um, so Bernays and you said that um, one of his descendants is like a Netflix exec. It kind of shows like the incestuous nature of both literal and like, you know, nepotism nature of like mm. the ruling class and stuff. Um, particularly like, I just remember reading about how like the guy who like founded, um, one of the founding, like predecessors of the FBI was like the attorney general that founded that was a descendant of Napoleon. So it's just kind of like <laughs> a similar thing like that. It's wild. It's like those sorts of like historical consistencies, like these family lines just pass all this shit down. So yeah. That's just... Right. Well, definitely. I, and I, that quote that, um, you referenced, um, what's interesting in it is that what it's basically saying is that democratic society, and let's look back at the word democracy. It's made up of demos and kratos, demos being the people, and more specifically, the common folk, the poor people. Um, that's something that's forgotten in the translations to English, but demos means the, the common people, what in Spanish would say el pueblo. Uh, and kratos means power, right? So it's power of the people, power of the common people, and what he's saying in that quote is, in essence, that democratic society requires the manipulation of the demos by an intellectual elite, which is like completely the antithesis of democracy. Most definitely. Yeah. Um, and just to point out as well that the Edward Bernays is actually the great uncle of Mark Bernays Randolph. Mark Bernays Randolph is the co-founder and CEO of Netflix. So... It's some somebody who has a lasting impact today, and this is why I'm very careful. And whenever people are like, "Oh, you got to watch this documentary about X Y Z," it's on Netflix. I'm like, I don't know. It's Netflix is like a, a propaganda machine in many ways. You know, there's some good stuff on it. I'm, I'm not gonna lie and act like I don't watch Netflix, but you know, this is all stuff that uh, they're all connected, right? There, all these people are connected, and uh, I'm glad you guys uh, pointed at that. Um, just to give some brief. Uh, biographical data about Bernays. So Bernays, Edward Bernays himself, was born on November 22nd, 1891 uh, in Vienna, Austria, Hungary, uh, back then when it was the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Actually, it's scary because he has, my birthday is November 23rd, he's November 22nd, so we're pretty close. Uh, let's see, Jacob said the original CEO of Netflix is a great, yeah, exactly. That's a, exactly what we were saying. Um, so basically, Edward Bernays, his family is very deeply connected to not only media and propaganda, but going back a lot of occult mystical elements. And this is where, again, if if anybody who's watching and listening to this, the second you begin to say Gnosticism or occult or mind, mind control, the second you say that, some people are like, okay, that's it. Because here's the thing, right? I'm a communist. I'm a, an atheist. I'm a dialectical materialist. I believe that the material uh, being determines uh, ideas, right? I'm not an idealist. I understand that. But we also have to have an open mind and approach the study of history in a way that recognizes that there were different civilizations and peoples and groups that had certain knowledge about the way the mind works. There's so much information that we're still learning today about the way the mind works works the way the power of influence psychology and how that impacts decision making that's something that is legit and so edward bernays's family so he was born 1891 in vienna austria hungary his mother anna was actually sigmund freud's sister and his father eli was the brother of freud's wife martha bernays so uh, before getting into Sigmund Freud and and his tremendous influence, because he had a tremendous influence on Edward Bernays, uh, I, Edward's uh, Edward Bernays's grandfather, his name was Isaac Bernays, and he 
lived around the time of the late 1700s and the early 1800s. And Isaac Bernays was the chief Orthodox rabbi of Hamburg, Germany. And he was actually the rabbi of Amschel Mayer Rothschild, who was the second child and the eldest son of Mayer Amschel Rothschild, the founder of the Rothschild banking dynasty. Again, once I say there are certain words that the second we hear them, we're programmed to tune out, right? Rothschild is one of them. Because here's the thing, and I'm and I will say this: I think there are some people who, especially on the libertarian right, who are great at pointing out like families who run the global economies and the Fed and stuff like that, and they're not able to understand that it's economics and capitalism. It's not like you know some ma magic uh, family that has secret powers or whatever. It's just capitalist families who have certain knowledge about things who are able to use the market. So this is sort of where I'm approaching it from, trying to find a uh, middle ground in that sense. So uh, Edward Bernays' grandfather, um, he, um, uh, so Edward's grandfather, Isaac Bernays, was the rabbi of Hamburg and was the rabbi to the Rothschild family. So his grandfather is very deeply connected to the Rothschild banking family, which of course had a lot of financial control of Europe at the time, was funding wars, was funding both sides. You know, you have the the Peninsular Wars where the and where the Rothschilds funded, you know, Napoleon, but they also funded uh, the British at Waterloo, uh, and they understood how to control situations to get the your desired outcome. Uh, Isaac Bernays, who again was uh, Edward Bernays's grandfather, uh, he was not only was he a rabbi, but he was also a student of the occult of mysticism, in particular. He was a student of a branch of uh, Hermetic uh, Kabbalah, which even today the the Jewish community actually denounces, called Frankism, uh, which followed the the claims of Jacob Frank, who Jacob Frank was somebody who was he was pretty crazy. He was nuts. He was basically created this cult leadership. Uh, most people, I would it's kind of like ISIS. Like I wouldn't even consider the Muslim. Uh, they're they're just uh, an imperialist. A terror group. Uh, they have nothing to do with Islam. The same thing with Jacob Frank and the Sabbateans and Frankism. They have nothing to do with Judaism. But within the study of Kabbalah, the occult, and ancient religious philosophy, there are certain writings about sexuality, about the mind, about the, the mind over body, about your animalistic behavior, about spirituality, that are very interesting and very fascinating. And there are some groups of people who abused that and, and took advantage of that. And uh, uh, Edward Bernays' grandfather, Isaac Bernays, uh, was a student of that, was involved with this movement called Frankism that basically promoted uh, people to push people to transcend moral boundaries, what they called it. They were famous for participating in orgies and doing and having sex in public and doing these very outlandish things that were based on on sexuality and basically degenerating society and promoting a famous quote in the occult do as thou will and and this is connected to capitalism right because when we look at wall street when we look at the golden calf on wall street the golden bull that golden bull is represent is symbolic within the occult knowledge the golden bull represents that very same system. Do as that will. You want to have 20 side chicks and three wives and, and exploit people with loans and debt? Go for it. You know, it's the powerful who win. And this is something that this family in particular has been very deeply involved in, the Bernays family. They were very much part of that tradition as the Rothschild as many others. So that's one uh, part of the family. Uh the other part of the family, again, Sigmund Freud, you know, he uh, was very interesting because he was a neurologist, the founder of psychoanalysis. One of the things about Freud that's really kind of weird when you start talking about sexuality, again, somebody who uh, Freud's family as well also came from a, a Kabbalistic family. His, his, his dad was a, a, a Kabbalist and also a Frankist as well, who studied sexuality uh, and studied um this whole concept of controlling people through uh, material desires, carnal desires. And around this time in the 1800s was also the rise of the bottling and distillation. You guys have all probably heard of Schweppes, 
the ginger ale company. A lot of these companies were founded by people in these communities of the occult who at that time were studying alchemy. And alchemy in many ways can be applied to many different things. If you're heating up pizza in your microwave, that's alchemy, right? Because you're using chemicals to create a certain outcome. But there's a dark side to it as well in the occult where you can use things like alcohol to control populations. In the 1800s, many European companies were already practicing this when it comes to the Americas and in particular with the Native American communities and using alcohol to control populations around the world in Africa and, and, and with the Native American communities, getting them drunk, having them sign treaties, giving up all their land and controlling people. And this is why when we talk about alchemy and alcohol, wines and spirits, you know, the term spirit comes from this idea that this uh, the spirit enters your body and controls you and dumbs you down and 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 makes you do things you wouldn't otherwise do. And so, you know, this is all to say, right, that his family was very much connected to a lot of these circles. They were students of the dark magic occult tradition, especially when it comes to mind control, when it comes to sex, when it comes to substances. Uh, Edward Bernays himself actually uh, worked for a French uh, agro company. One of his first gigs. Um, you know, he, he, he worked for, uh, the New York city produce exchange, uh, and he worked for the Louis Dreyfus and, and company, in, which in the 1850s was one of their main products was sugar. Sugar, as we know, has no nutritional value. Sugar has no intrinsic benefit to us as humans. If anything, it's one of the worst processed sugar is one of the worst things for you. The first company that Edward Bernays was working for Louis Dreyfus and company, and the 1850s was making trillions and trillions of dollars at that moment. Uh, I would say probably billions, but if we adjust it today for the value, uh, sugar in the 1800s was one of the most valuable commodities. And Edward Bernays, in his role with this company, was branding, making sugar uh, desirable, making people hooked on sugar so that it became such an essential part of the economy. And of course, this contributed largely to colonization. Whereas what was one of the biggest exporters of sugar at this time? Cuba, Haiti, uh, Barbados, uh, the, the Caribbean, the, the tropical uh, areas. So this is hand in hand with colonization. So, you know, he's, he's basically the propagandist for this venomous product called processed sugar and, and, and making it making it palatable, desirable to, to the masses, getting people hooked on it. So that way you can make money from it. So, um, that's sort of his early career. I'll pause there. Cause I know that's a lot uh, to take in, but I just also wanted to establish that context because Edward Bernays, family and his upbringing was very much connected to so much of the things that we're talking about, mind control, uh, alchemy, the dark, arts and later on we'll see as we'll talk about especially when he goes uh into uh, world war one and the coup in guatemala you know he applies this dark magic practices to imperialism and to war yeah it's really interesting and and kind of twisted when you think about like the cia strategy um which has just become a state department strategy overall but there was a leaked cia doc where they said they were doing this um, where they label anybody who questions the State Department or U.S. imperialism as a conspiracy theorist. Um, so then they have this, you know, mainstream media that's created that's wrong, um, or at least, you know, a huge stretch from what the actual truth is. Um, and then if you point out that it's wrong, you get called a conspiracy theorist. Um, so it kind of creates this opposite world. Yeah, and I think... Um something you like point out that I found really interesting is this kind of like interesting, I guess, contradiction between like how the ruling class still like um, pushes things like, um, like drugs or like alcohol on workers and on working people and um, colonized people, especially like someone brought up in the comments about like um, the opium wars in um, India and China and stuff like that. So um, like pushing, well, pushing opium. And then it was like, there's that interesting like contradiction between doing that and at the same time doing things like the war on drugs or like later prohibition in the United States. Um, I don't know from where I'm from, there's still dry counties in the South. So it's like that. Um, yeah. So it's a weird like contradiction between like pushing drugs to like make sure, you know, to make people like 
uh, dissociate or whatever, and then also, yeah, trying to crack down on it. So, yeah, definitely. I think that's a great point. And related to Bernays and in particular tobacco, Bernays is well known for promoting the use of cigarettes and making cigarettes connected to feminism. Interestingly enough, Edward Bernays married Doris Fleischman in 1922. Doris was a writer, public relations executive, and quote, feminist activist. Of course, we know it's bourgeois feminism and not uh, proletarian feminism. And interestingly enough, his wife Doris was a contemporary of and colleague of none other than Margaret Sanger, who is the founder of Planned Parenthood. And that's another can of worms because Planned Parenthood, as we know, was deeply connected to the eugenics movement. They believed in reducing the populations of what they des described as undesirable populations. And one of the most sinister elements of the eugenics society, Margaret Sanger, Planned Parenthood, and a lot of the early eugenics movement of the 1900s in the US is that a lot of it was not necessarily aimed in a way of going out and murdering minorities, Black, Latino people, uh, Indigenous people, but getting people to do that to themselves, and poor people, getting people to do that to themselves, right? How do you get, this is, these are conversations that the eugenic society would have all the time, where it was like, because there's a narrative, and again, this is connected to Bernays and his understanding of scripts, narratives, the good guy, the bad guy, and how do you influence people in a certain direction? You set up a scenario and you set up a, a situation where you you get your desired outcome by, by making it seem like the person is doing it to themselves. So getting indigenous peoples, black Latino people hooked on alcohol and drugs, getting getting people to into this lower vibrational state of existence where they're killing themselves and even today we see the outcomes of this with food deserts and the hoods like you go to out here in LA where I live you go to South Central you go to Compton you go to East LA you go to some of these uh, black and brown working class communities the only outlets the only stores there are liquor stores right where you can buy bottled poison uh, created by dark magicians to kill yourself or you could go to McDonald's where there's other poison that's repackaged as food where you also kill yourself. And isn't it interesting that some of the highest causes of death within poor working class black and brown communities are heart disease, diabetes, uh, all these different things, tobacco, you know, so how, so it's literally happening now as we speak where these magicians and these eugenicists who want to eliminate the, the, the population want to get rid of people who no longer, especially as capitalism is advancing as they're, basically uh, they're they're using technology to get rid of so many jobs service jobs there's no longer any need for this what they consider low skilled or unskilled labor and then you have these large communities of poor black and brown people well what do you do with them right let's get them to kill themselves with these chemicals that we're using uh and then none of the heat is on us right and so this is again connected to planned parenthood connected to edward bernays's wife doris who was a feminist who promoted cigarette use among women, who promoted uh, black and brown women getting abortions, which, you know, I'm not going to get into that again. Uh, but I find that really fascinating, you know, uh, also promoting uh, alcohol usage, promoting sexuality. Edward Bernays was also very, uh, very well known for using, promoting uh, sexuality in posters, like for one ballet that he wanted to promote. Uh, to create interest in a ballet uh, for uh, Sergei Dayakhilov, I'm probably butchering his name. Uh, he basically uh, promote. He publicized a picture of a woman wearing a tight fitting dress uh, at the Bronx Zoo, wearing a snake, and he just kind of pushed the limits. He promoted this view of, you know, do as thou will of of open sexuality, and people may be surprised to hear this because a lot of people equate the left and Marxism and communism with the postmodern understanding of like the hippie anarchist kind of approach where it's like, Oh, like if you're, you're cons like, you know, we're speaking out against conservatism. Like, you know, we're, we promote drug use, we promote uh, sexuality everywhere. But if you actually meet real communists around the world, 
even Fidel's later writings where he talks about like advertisements and and how they and mind control like it's very different communists are not like the postmodern view that we have in in the west you know of of do as thou will and anarchism and 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 drink and consume um so that that's something that's really important to to keep in mind uh bernays's earliest work again was consumer brands he worked for dixie cup uh campaign uh so one of the things in the 30s uh he his Dixie Cup campaign was designed to convince consumers that only disposable cups were sanitary by linking the imagery of an overflowing cup with subliminal images of vaginas and venereal diseases. You can look this up. This is all uh, mentioned in his writings. Uh, he also advised the U.S. Information Agency during World War II. He also advised the earliest intelligence agencies of the state of Israel. He was a big time Zionist. He supported the creation of this, the so-called state of Israel. Uh, so th these are some of his earliest works. Uh, and I'll pause it there before we talk about Guatemala and his uh, his main project um, during the, the 1950s. I pulled up the uh, Dixie Cup, some of the Dixie Cup uh, propaganda. I wanted to um, to mention an interesting fact that I came across uh, almost accidentally, like a couple hours ago, um, I was watching one of the Vijay uh, Prashad interviews on Ho Chi Minh, and uh, he he said that one of the things that Ho Chi Minh uh, loved doing was smoking Lucky Strike cigarettes. Mm. <laughs> he says that he would play with them in his hand. And um, this film that was done in '69, it was called um, uh, La Primavera de '69, so it's a '69 fall. Um, it uh, it was done by Cuban um, by Cuban directors, and it shows him spinning the cigarette, and it's the Lucky Strike cigarette that <laughs> um, that um, that Bernays uh, was famous for for you know testing out the ideas of propaganda with. Yeah, no, it's it's um it's crazy, it's crazy to see that. I said one thing that um just that the whole thing about the Dixie Cup thing that's reminded me of is how like. Um, there's the propaganda that banana companies push that you can't like um, put bananas in the fridge or they go bad because they turn brown, but on the inside, they're still fine. It's just something that yeah. banana companies push in like the fifties to sell more bananas. So you don't put your bananas in the fridge. Same thing. <laughs> oh, and also just the whole <laughs> thing, what you brought up about Margaret Sanger, it just like reminds me of just like right wingers latch on to things like Margaret Sanger and like try and um, turn them like, wild conspiracy theories i mean which you know mm -hmm. whatever i enjoy conspiracy theories um but they uh like latch onto that now anytime you bring up the fact that yeah margaret singer was problematic and had like a bunch of issues you get like attached to them like it's like you get like linked as if you're like to basically you know they believe that she's like she's like a lizard person or something like that <laughs> so <laughs> yeah yeah, you don't need the con you don't need the lizard person conspiracies. Like Bill Gates is saying it openly in the New York Times that you know Africa needs to depopulate, and he's pushing um, birth control um, and you know all sorts of methods of depopulation in Africa, using billions of dollars to do it. So you know that the conspiracies are real, and <laughs> you can just Google them pretty much. Yeah, I mean that's that's the irony about the U.S. political vision or views or tendencies is that in some ways both sides like the, the the two main heads that we see the liberals and the conservatives in some ways they're both seeing elements of truth right because when liberals point out you know we defend lgbtq rights as communists yeah we support that right uh we support helping poor and working class people that's what the liberals talk about and representation we support that as well obviously from a different perspective but then conservatives they'll point out things like populism right like and we'll agree with that when we talk about like the the swamp and dc mm -hmm. these elites who run the system i i agree with that to, to to a certain extent you know when they they tend to be also the right wing tends to be a little bit more quote conspiratorial or at least more open to hearing about uh things like like uh, plans within the government to do certain things. But then it's just interesting because then the right wing will take it. They always bring it back to China somehow. Uh, it's always China uh, evil. So it's a, it's subverted too, you know? So it's like somebody who's conspiratorial minded, I think is somebody who's a critical thinker. 
like if you question 9-11, if you question these things, but then the right wing subverts it and brings it, oh, China's the reason, right? Uh, but then the the left, the, the liberal Democrats do that as well. Where they're like, yeah, we support LGBTQ uh, fighter pilots bombing Afghanistan, you know? So it's like in, in both ways, they're both bringing you back to like the wrong uh, decision. And we're only seen with these two options. And ironically enough, that's also what Bernays in many ways did is like, you know, it's like Coke or Pepsi. Well, they're both fucking horrible for you. You know, they both kill you. So why even fit into this false dichotomy? So it's like by presenting these two options, false options, you're some you're being shepherded into this alternative, this third alternative that has been uh, designed for you. And in many ways, that is what has happened. That has been one of the biggest problems facing the U.S. left in particular the left in general, you know, I, I'm not sure if you have you guys ever met people who are like, I'm not left or right. I'm I'm my own thing, you know, or and this is the, the, what happens with a lot of anarchists, too. Right. Where they're like, you know, I don't the left is just as bad. The communist is just as bad as capitalists. Like I'm independent on my own thing. Was well, like, OK, by doing that, you're you're following the path. Like, that's how they want you to. They're shepherding you into that false third position where you just lose hope and everything, but by default, you're still supporting capitalism, you know? And it's like, it, it's des designed to do that. And, and and this is like, these are some of the techniques that Edward Bernays uh, did, you know, going into uh, Guatemala in particular. So you have uh, Edward Bernays, who was hired by a United Fruit Company, uh, which today still exists as a Chiquita Brands International. Uh, he was hired to basically promote the sale of bananas. And one of the things that he did was hitting up celebrities at the time and sending them bananas and asking them to take pictures with it and just putting it out there, right? Having subconscious subconscious branding, just sending out bananas and having everybody promote it. Uh, and basically, he became very involved with the United Fruit Company, which we know at the time had a whole empire. My family in Honduras... Honduras actually the the nickname uh, Banana Republic actually comes from Honduras where where my family's from, and Honduras was one of the biggest colonies for the United Fruit Company in the 1950s, and was heavily destroyed by people like Edward Bernays because of some of the techniques of uh, not only like it, uh, so it's interesting because uh, my grandfather he was a, a union organizer in Honduras and and he was active in my family's from the northern coast of Honduras, where is a lot of bananas and plantains are grown. And anybody who was union organizing, who was a labor activist, because the conditions were fucking horrible. Uh, it, at any point, if you were organizing, you were branded as a communist, which we know at that time to be a communist in Latin America in the 50s was pretty bad, you know, so uh, you were murdered, you were just straight up massacred. And there were so many massacres that we can point to of banana uh, workers. And so that was one of the techniques that Bernays perfected is like you had like scaring the crap out of people and basically uh, drumming up fear and going into these things about the, the communist menace and the Soviet, you're just Soviet agents, right? And this is, it's interesting because this happens even today whenever you defend Russia and Putin, when we talk about Ukraine, when people are like, oh, you're a, a Putin uh, sympathizer and agent. And like he kind of pioneered Russophobia in many ways, uh, in particular when it comes to fruit, uh, fruit workers and banana workers, because uh, he would design these posters that they would use and translate to Spanish of like a uh, Russian uh, uh, octopus, or they would have like Stalin as like an octopus. Uh, going into Latin America and being like, you know, you're a, a communist Asian if you're trying to organize unions. And so uh, this is, you know, my this hits close to home for me because in Honduras, uh, the so-called Banana Republic, like he was crafting a lot of these spells, which even to this day have played such a major role in, in making people, exactly, that, this is the kind of propaganda uh, that they would use that the United Fruit Company and Edward Bernays would 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 put out there to make it seem like if you were fighting for your rights in any ways, even if you were not communist in any way, uh, you were an agent of the Soviet Union. And so this played a major role in, as the comrade mentioned in the chat, in the 1954 coup against 
uh, Jacobo Arbenz, who was the president of Guatemala, not a communist at all, by the way. He was like a liberal. Uh, interestingly enough, this was the time period during which Ernesto Che Guevara was radicalized. It was during Ernesto Che Guevara's uh, visit to Honduras and Guatemala, where Ernesto Che Guevara said one of his most famous quotes. Uh, I'm going to paraphrase here, but he says something along the lines of, I will not rest uh, until uh, I slay... Uh, no, he said, I pray, he's like, I I pray before the a picture of Comrade Stalin that I will not rest my arms until I slash the tentacles of this capitalist octopus known as the United Fruit Company. Um, and it's a beautiful quote. And his journey through Honduras and Guatemala were very, very pivotal in his political transformation as a communist, as a Marxist, where he met a lot of uh, indigenous peoples who were fighting the United Fruit Company. and. The coup happened, right? So Jacob Arbenz was the president of Guatemala. He was liberal, left-leaning. He wasn't like a communist in any way, but he wanted to nationalize a lot of the agriculture industry and introduce labor laws, basic, simple stuff. And of course, Edward Bernays played a major role in branding him as a communist subversive, as an agent of the Soviet Union, and basically putting out this propaganda. And what's interesting is that... <clears throat> Edward Bernays, uh, at that time period, he was the sole correspondent for a lot of these uh, major publications at the time. Again, he was working for U.S. intelligence. He was working for uh, Israeli intelligence. And he was the person on the ground reporting about all this information, uh, which ended up... Le so he was supplying all the stories to the agencies, right? Like he was crafting that narrative to Newsweek, to Time Magazine, the New, uh, New York Herald Tribune, which existed at the time. The New York Times, he was like the source. You know, when the New York Times comes up with these bullshit stories, like an un unidentified source, sources say, it's like, who are these sources, right? Edward Bernays was one of these sources who was crafting this narrative that eventually led to Jacob Arbenz's overthrow in Operation PB Success, the coup d'etat that overthrew him, uh, carried out by the CIA. And afterward, that coup led to basically 40 years of violence carried out by the right-wing Guatemalan military dictatorship against uh, militant revolutionary indigenous groups and labor groups that were fighting for their rights. So, you know, his Edward Bernays, again, like this, this hits close to home. This is not something that is in the abstract. This is not something that, and, and, and think about it like this, right? In many ways, Edward Bernays and his propaganda and his spellcraft was responsible for these wars in Central America and these wars in Central America were responsible for mass migration during the 80s and the 90s and even to this day. So it's all connected. It's all interrelated. And, um, you know, that's just a, a sense of, of who he was and what he did. And well, while we're on the topic of Guatemala and what Edward Bernays' uh, research or work um, helped lead to, something similar to like the um, Tuskegee Civil Study um, that happened in Tuskegee, Alabama, um, something similar happened in Guatemala where they attempted to basically test the course of syphilis in, um, I believe, I guess some prisoners and other people um, within Guatemala. And unlike the Tuskegee study where they technically didn't inject people with syphilis, they did do that in Guatemala. And yeah, so it's just kind of like the whole, all of it's like interconnected because they're only able to do that because of the power that like banana companies and others had over those countries. So yeah, just like reflects that in the time. Great point. Yeah, definitely. I also find it interesting you mentioned oh sorry go ahead Eddie. Oh, okay. Uh I was just going to say Jacobo Arbenz you mentioned he wasn't even a communist. Um he didn't he wanted to give to the people the sections of land that United Fruit Company owned that they weren't using productively. So he didn't even yeah. want to take any land that they were using at all. Um and they still he ended up boiled to death in a bathtub. Sorry if that was a spoiler for later but um crazy. Yeah. They should have done like Fidel and what what did he do where he um took their lands or whatever and only paid them uh the amount of money that they like had claimed on the earlier taxes or something the like taxes. that. <laughs> yeah, they should have done like yeah. Fidel. It's been great. <laughs> well, if Latin America teaches us something is that half measures are costly, right? Um that you have to go all the way and then su suppress these people's power because if you even give them a little inch, as uh, Che Guevara says in the, the speech as in your introduction, ni tantico así. Imperialism comes in 
through wherever to do what it has to do. Um, but one of the things in, in preparation for the stream, I, I read the, the wiki article on Bernays, and I noticed as you were talking that one of the things that it omits to talk about is his role in uh, the propaganda behind Israel. Um, so can you speak a little bit about that? Most definitely. Uh, that's very fascinating as well, because when we talk about Israel and Bernays, again, right, you have people on the right who they view it in a very backward way where they're, they're just like, oh, this is uh, a Jewish conspiracy or this is, um, you know, this is like they're ruining the U.S., their replacement theory and all this stuff. And again, that that's there in order to subvert like the actual a Marxist understanding of of, of Bernays uh, from a, a communist perspective. Right. Um, it's it's kind of like Alex Jones. They put Alex Jones out there to to to, to act crazy. So that way, whenever you bring up some things that he has brought up that are like, huh, that's an interesting question. Um, the second you bring that up, you're kind of disregarded. Uh, it's very similar with Israel. So Edward Bernays, again, I mentioned his family uh, was very, very deeply involved uh, in a lot of group, powerful groups, the Rothschild family in particular, and that was responsible for the creation of the state of Israel. We know that the actual, actually, the the, the song Hava Nagila, uh, if you guys have ever heard of it, uh, was actually like a celebration song. Uh, of the Balfour Declaration, that was a communication between the Rothschild family and, and Balfour, who I think was uh, English state, statesman at the time, basically campaigning for the creation of the state of Israel. And the Bernays family, uh, they were they were sort of like the artist, the artist, and the propagandist behind the the Rothschilds, because the Rothschilds were just straight up bankers. Like they weren't charismatic; nobody liked them. They were just really fucking good at controlling economies, controlling banks and creating wars and funding both sides so that they profit from all the wars. But the Bernays family was, was very, in particular, uh, they were really involved in, in media and publications. And what's interesting about Edward Bernays and the, the so-called state of Israel is that he was one of the biggest advice. He was actually Edward Bernays, uh, he was, so we, we got to kind of create a context for the situation, right? So Edward Bernays was very much a part of the New York City, 1930s, 1940s, hipster, left-leaning vibe of the era. So just to kind of paint a picture for you, right? Trotsky was kind of involved in these circles as well. Just to kind of paint a picture for you, I want to take you back to 1940s New York City. I'm from New York, right? 19 1940s New York. Uh, there's a very big Jewish population in New York, right? Uh, Trotsky was from the Bronx. Trotsky was involved in this community, and so we know that the forces behind the creation of the state of Israel were in no way progressive. Were in no way left leaning. They promote imperialism. They promote the rule of finance and. In fact, many of the actual religious Jews who actually follow the Torah and the Talmud are anti-Zionist and say that glorification of the state of Israel is, is against our religion, and, and they point that out. So Zionism as an entity is something separate. So the the, the people like the Rothschild family and, and, and all of these people, they needed to rebrand the Zionism in a way that appealed to the masses at the time. And in New York, uh, in particular with the Bunda circles and all that, there was a sort of left-wing take to Israel and Zionism. And you have the rise of what's called kibbutzism. The, the kibbutz, a Hebrew, is like the, the commune or the collective. And you would see early posters of these Zionist settlers who would, it was like, set up your homestead, set up your, your commune in Israel and Palestine. And 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 be a so and, and it was almost branded in a socialist way, where it was like roll up your sleeves and go farming and set up your settlement and your commune in, in Palestine and and reclaim Israel. So Edward Bernays was very much a part of that. I'm gonna mispronounce the, the name of the organization, but it's like B N E I B R I T H Benai Brith. It's like an, uh, one of the oldest intelligence organizations for the state of Israel. Sort of predates, precedes Mossad, and 
Bernays was uh, an advisor to them. And Bernays was very much like, look, if we're going to sell Zionism, if we're going to sell Israel, we have to, first of all, taper it and mold it to the interests of our base here in New York. It's 1940s. You have progressive and, and many amazing communists, by the way, who at the time were part of the Communist Party USA. The CPSA had a lot of uh, New York uh, Jewish communists at the time. That was actually one of the biggest hubs. And so Edward Bernays was able to infiltrate these circles and bring them toward this sort of liberal Zionist elements, where it's like, hey, let's create this liberal Zionist paradise called Israel, where you know women have all you know can smoke cigarettes and and you can have uh, you know all these alcohol and all these things, and and so he was able to to redirect this very revolutionary group of people toward and subvert it toward the Zionist cause, uh, and and that's why when we talk about early Zionism, even the Soviet Union, my biggest critique of, I love Stalin, you guys know I love Stalin, uh, my biggest critique of uh, of Stalin at this time period and many Soviet Union people uh, was their early support of Israel. You know, maybe we, that's another discussion for another time, but I think they misunderstood. They were also kind of captivated by the spell of like this progressive liberal uh, Zionist paradise, right, based on settlements. And so it wasn't until the 70s that the, the socialist bloc really uh, had a better understanding that uh, supporting the Palestinian freedom struggle and Arab liberation and Baathism was, was a better position as a communist than supporting like labor Zionism, right? And so uh, Bernays was very much responsible for branding Israel as like this liberal paradise. And that propaganda still resonates today when we talk about, and when you hear these Zionists who are like, you know, Israel is the only place in the Middle East where women can walk freely. We see we see it happening now with Iran, right? Where they're like, oh, uh, you know, you know women and burning their hijabs and women doing the And it's like, dude, like you can't take this Western mindset and apply it to the Middle East without understanding like the context. And so like that whole uh, psyop, right, of like women burning hijabs and women uh, promoting sexuality, uh, that's also another uh, technique within this school of Bernays and, and Zionism uh, that, that Israel very much promotes. So uh, it's just very fascinating. He also, uh, touching on Guatemala, we also have to remember that Guatemala was one of the first countries to recognize the state of Israel. It was actually the first country in Latin America and the Caribbean to recognize Israel. Why? That's pretty random, right? Like Guatemala is fucking like thousands of miles away from Israel, probably as far away from quote unquote Israel as can be. How is this impoverished Central American country going to recognize the state of Israel? Well, that was because after Jaco Arbenz was overthrown in this coup, Guatemala, be, because of Bernays, became such a hub of Zionism, which to this very day is, is an issue, especially with the evangelical church. You go all over Central America, you see uh, the, the Star of David, but in the Zionist way, promoted everywhere, Jehovah, you know, all this stuff. Um, so this is the, the roots of early Zionism in Latin America and the Caribbean. I, I've talked about this before, that Zionism is an international phenomenon. It impacts not only Palestine and the Middle East, but Latin America. During the 60s and 70s the and the 80s, the, the right-wing evangelical death squads that murdered communists and indigenous peoples were trained by Israel, were trained by Taiwan as well, and, and South Korea. But we're Zionist supporters, right? When we talk about Sigmund Rhee and and these these fucking nut jobs, they all had the same racist view of indigenous peoples like Palestinians, right? They're undesirables, they're they're unwanted, they're not like us, you know. And and this is very much uh, the the birth of Zionist thinking in Latin America and the Caribbean that I would argue Bernays is very much responsible for implanting uh, in Guatemala in particular. Yeah, so I mean, I think an interesting point about like, especially in particular labor Zionism is that, yeah, I think as you pointed out, it's very, very well is that it's uh, it was basically a way to kind of like uh, recruit like more progressive or like uh, socialist leaning people towards um, like approving of Zionism. And I think one interesting point, there's a good book called um, Comrades and Enemies by um, Zachary Lockman, which kind of goes into early labor Zionism and like a lot of their theoretical work and like one of the points he makes that's really interesting is that he actually argues that like the labor Zionists were more racist than like um, Jabotinsky and like other, the more like hardcore right-wing Zionists. Cause like they basically had to do like a Terra Nullius sort of argument where they either said 
the Arabs here, like, or the Palestinians here don't exist, or they're, like, incapable of organizing themselves. And while at least, like, um, like the more right-wing Zionists, like, at least acknowledge their existence, and we're just like, we just got to get rid of them. Um, and then also, I think an interesting point is how, like, the British government, one of the reasons why they wanted to support Zionism in the first place is that they saw, at least a lot of their leaders thought that there was, like, um, basically thought, like, you know, Jewish global power, like, that Jewish people were, like, globally powerful, like, were, you know, pulled the strings behind the scenes sort of deal, and that their argument was that we need to push them towards Zionism instead of, like, towards communism, because they also had this thing where they thought that all Jews were also either communists or Zionists, so that they decided we're going to throw our hat in with the Zionists instead of the communists, or, you know, basically to fight communism. So that's kind of, like, you know, wraps us all together, and it's just, like, an interesting point. Definitely. This is an interesting point, too. I grew up in an evangelical church, so mm. um, I always see that. I, I grew up seeing this connection. You were always supposed to support Israel um, because of the rapture, because uh, eventually Israel's going to go up in flames and Jesus is going to come back. And it's like the most anti Semitic thing ever, but um, because of it, you're supposed to support Zionism in Israel. Um, it's. Something that, I don't know, some of my family members have never understood, and I've tried to explain to them, you know, what Israel's doing and its connection to the U.S. State Department um, and the way that they use religion to to get people to um, support these things. But, yeah, it's interesting because, yeah, you have, like, the most anti-Semitic narrative um, that's used to get people to support um, the state of Israel. That's uh just to touch on that point. I didn't know that about you, Eddie. That's really fascinating. Uh, and thanks for sharing that. I find I recently have been obviously like here's the here's the thing, guys. It's funny because I'm a communist and you guys know me, but whenever I I read a lot of different books and texts, and people will assume like I'm reading the Bible, I'm this, or I'm reading this and I'm that. I, I try to read as much as possible as I can. And recently I've been reading a lot about the birth of the evangelical church and its connections to Zionism. And if you're an evangelical or if you've been in evangelical circles, one phrase or term that you've probably heard is Shekhinah. And Shekhinah is Hebrew for the divine feminine. And this is a, an element that one of the books I was recently reading, the Zohar, it talks about the Shekinah, the, the divine fight. It's a beautiful concept, actually, because when we conceptualize our understanding of, of God or whatever, however you want to define that, a lot of times modern religion is so focused on the man, the male aspect. Shekinah is a female, is the divine feminine, is like the mother, the mother, uh, the wife of God. And what's interesting is that they've taken this, a beautiful concept like this, like you know, you, you have like in Islam, for example, the, the logo of Islam, the main iconography is the crescent and the star, the crescent moon and the star, which represents the unity of the divine masculine and the divine feminine. The moon, la luna in Spanish is feminine, the moon, and then el sol, the sun is masculine. So you have this unity of divine masculine and feminine. We also see this in a lot of the ancient texts as well. So Shekinah, but the evangelicals have subverted this term because what they do, they refer to the divine feminine Shekinah when they refer to Israel. So you'll have these evangelical pastors that are like saying, we have to fight for Shekinah. We have to defend Shekinah, which is like our divine mother, our holy mother. And they begin giving female attributes women's attributes to israel we have to defend her we have to save her and it all what that creates is like this image of these even these right-wing evangelical dudes you know trumper guys who are like we got to go in and save her like these hyper masculine dudes who are like you know they they see that image of israel as a woman as like the divine feminine and we have to go in and save her and that even in itself uh, Edward Bernays, his early propaganda work for uh, Bernays Brith, I'm mispronouncing the word, but that's basically how it's spelled, uh, was use, painting Israel as feminine, right? Using the images of soil, going back to kibbutzism, soil a lot of times is associated, equated with feminine, uh, with, you know, what grows from the soil, the, like gives birth to vegetation. Using these elements, 
giving uh, female attributes, divine feminine attributes to Israel, that is so central to evangelical thought today. And that this is how one of the spells that they use in order to to save, uh, to, to promote uh, Zionism and to say, like, we need to save Israel from these uh, Muslim barbarians who they only attribute with hyper masculinity. Right. And the, that's one of the things that the Zionists do as well. They say, like, uh, these Muslims are just these angry men. Right. Uh, they, they never show women. Right? They're just these angry men who are just violent. And but Israel is this beautiful woman who needs to be, you know. So it's like th this is part of the psychology that that Edward Bernays employs from Freud, from so many people in his family who are magicians. They're high level magicians, and uh, people fall for it hook, line, and sinker. Huh. I don't know if this is connected to Bernays at all, but some of my family members recently went on a trip to Israel. Um, mm. <laughs> and they told us that the guide, well, they, I mean, my family members, unfortunately, uh, believed this was true hundred percent. Um, but their guide said that there were a small amount of, um, Israeli soldiers and then a giant mass of Palestinian soldiers. And then God came down from the heavens. This was in the 1970s and, and helped the Israeli soldiers fight the Palestinians and win the battle and take their land. Um, and my, Relatives were telling me this as if it was true. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god! <laughs> it's kind of crazy. God in the U.S. Believe. military, right? Yeah, like, and then I, they were talk. This was like supposedly around 1970, like you know, right around the time the U.S. started dumping a bunch of money and arms into Israel. I'm like, is God the U.S. empire? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's fascinating. I have a question, and I think it's connected to uh, the sort of image you painted uh, with 40s New York and this liberal atmosphere that Bernays was in. He rejected um, an offer to work and do propaganda for the Nazis. Um, mm, right? yep. But then later on in his uh, autobiography, he almost uh, he, he praises the, the fact that Goebbels was reading his books and that part of Nazi ideology and the, the methods and tactics they used came from Bernays and the stuff that he was writing in his books in the 20s. So can you speak a little bit about that? Dude, that's such a, a great point. Um, and here's the thing, guys. A lot of the early Zionist movement, first of all, it's important to mention, uh, again, right, this is where it's important to reinforce that the difference between Zionism and Judaism, right? There were many people, Theodore Herzl was a Zionist. He was not even religious at all. He just supported the creation of the state of Israel. The Rothschilds were, were Zionists um, and they used Judaism as a vehicle to just push their aims and, and, and try to get people to support that. One of the problems that the early Zionists had, Theodore Herzl writes about this, uh, all the time, uh, and some of the early Zionists, uh, Menachem Begin, who was around during the 80s in particular, and also the first presidents and prime ministers of the state of Israel, when they didn't have a state yet, when they were still the Zionist organizations or the World Zionist Congress, one of the problems, and they openly admit this, guys, I, I can try to find the, the books and documents, but they basically say that there's not enough support for Zionism. And one of the reasons for Israel, and one of the reasons was the Soviet Union, because a lot of Jewish people felt, remember, when the Tsarist Russia, they had uh, pogroms, so they were murdering a lot of Hasidic Jews uh, in what is today, especially Ukraine and, and, and Belarus and Poland. So the communist movement and the Soviet Union, they had, and in particular, and also the communist movement in the U.S., they had a lot of support from working class, poor Jewish people who were like, eh, we don't, why are we trying to go back to quote unquote Israel? Like we're good. We, you know, we're part of the communist party USA in, in New York. We have a community there where we live in the Soviet union. You know, we have rights there that we didn't have before. So there wasn't a demand, right. And I, this goes back to marketing and branding, right. You have to create a demand for something. So it's like, if you want something, if you want, a certain outcome you have to create a demand for it and in many ways the early zionists who preceded this creation of the state of israel they needed something they needed something to justify 
the creation of the state of Israel. Now, tapping into these mind control techniques, and and again, uh, one thing I just do want to point out here is that um, I wrote it down in, in specifically for this reason uh, in talking about this. Uh, you know, he Edward Bernays talked referred to his work as quote psychological warfare, um, and one of the things that the that Edward Bernays in particular studied um, was hypnosis, right? And what is hypnosis is basically uh, I'm just going to read the definition that I wrote: human condition involving focused attention, uh, selective attention, uh, reduced peripheral awareness. And here's the important part, an enhanced capacity to respond to suggestion, right? So how do you suggest a certain outcome? Uh, Edward Bernays went to conferences, study in particular hypnosis. And so one of the early Zionists in many ways, um, they actually, in many ways, when, as the, the, the Nazi party was rising in Germany, they sort of rode that wave. And, and here's where, you know, I don't want to like, um, I also myself, I have to do more research on this, and, and I'll say this openly. But there is, there are arguments out there that say that many of the wealthier Zionists actually funded and supported the the rise of the Nazi movement in order to, because they 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 knew that the Nazis were very anti-Semitic. They knew that the Nazis um, wanted to, you know, had a very false and racist view uh, of Jewish people. And so in many ways, the Zionists are like, yo, here's our shot. You know, here, if we're going to build, if we're going to push for the creation of the state of Israel, we need to have something that, that, that wakes people up. That's like, it's kind of like 9-11, right? Like, how do you get the U.S. to invade the Middle East? You got to scare the crap out of people. You got to, and, and I just, I do want to preface that by saying, again, right, because the right wing will say, oh, the Holocaust never happened. No, the Holocaust happened. A lot of crazy shit happened. But then when you start investigating the connections between the Rothschild family and Hitler, uh, a lot of these Zionists, bankers, and the Nazi party, I find it kind of weird that a lot of Z early Zionists, powerful Zionists, did business with the Nazis. You look at Volkswagen, you look at Bayer, you look at a lot of these, uh, especially pharmaceutical companies, it's pretty weird that they would, you know, collaborate. And so um, that's one area, again, I'm not going to say for certain, because I still have to do that research my myself. Um, but I think that it's interesting that a lot of the early Zionists and people who promoted the creation of Israel collaborated with the Nazis. And that is publicly and confirmed information. Uh, and I think Edward Bernays uh, and his connection to that wing, that liberal, not even really, I wouldn't even consider them religious. They're just crazy. They're just, their religion is capitalism, you know, uh, the Zionists. Um, so that that's a very interesting part of that history that to be totally honest with you, I would have to do more research on, but it is, it's fascinating. It's really interesting. Go ahead, Eddie. I can't remember my question. You can go ahead. Sorry. I didn't have a hopefully question. This, hopefully oh. this doesn't get shut down by YouTube. By the way. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> Cause it, I mean, it makes sense. Um, and as you had mentioned uh, earlier, um, a ton of Jewish people are against Zionism and, and against right. Israel. They see it as antagonistic to their religion. Um, Alex, do you have any comments? You've published some of the best stuff that we've published online concerning um, Zionism. Um, I don't really know enough about the, the collaboration between, um, I suppose, like the collaboration between like, Zionists and the rise of Nazi Germany. I don't really know enough about that to comment on it. Um, but I would be interested to know how many people like, I mean, were you know, willing to do business with like Henry Ford and others who was like openly, mm -hmm. anti pretty openly anti-Semitic. Um, funnily enough, Henry Ford is like the Ford plantation in my hometown. Um, so Henry Ford, yeah, he built like a lot of that, but obviously it's, I'm assuming a lot of people know he got like the, I think like, I can't remember, I think it's the, the cross of the German Grand Eagle or something like that. Some like sort of like military um, award. And there's like a picture of him with um, Nazi officials just chilling there, cheesing. Um, so yeah, interesting guy. Um, and then obviously, yeah, you know, like a lot of American companies were perfectly willing to cooperate with the Nazis. So yeah, throughout like the war, I think, um, I know, well, obviously, um, Ford Werk, which was like the name of the, um, German city area Ford company did like a lot of, um, business with the Nazis, like even 
deep into the war. And the same thing with like, I'm pretty sure GM and IBM did like the same sorts of things. So, and then the, what the, one of the CEOs of Texaco was a huge fascist, loved Franco, provided them a whole lot of oil um, during the Spanish Civil War. So yeah, a lot of fun with US capitalists and cooperation with the Nazis. Yeah, great history there. I don't know if you guys could see it, but uh, I screen shared uh, one article. It's from the Journal of Palestine Studies. If you guys, if you guys have JSTOR, uh, check it out. It's called "The Secret Contact: Zionism and Nazi Germany, 1933 to 1941," uh, by Klaus uh, Polkin. Very interesting. Uh, I read part of it. Um, there's a lot of interesting information there about what, what I was referencing earlier. Some of the early collaboration. Uh, definitely worth checking out. Um, this is something that's very hard to find information about, by the way. Um, and if you do kind of go down that rabbit hole, as I have um, people, you know, people are, here's the thing. A lot of times, too, people are scared of just asking questions like that. Like, that happened to me with, like, 9-11, you know, when I'm like, okay, I don't know. I'm not those people who say 100% this or that happened. But there are things that I'm asking myself, like, Huh, building seven fell and no plane hit it. That's pretty weird, you know. And huh, it's interesting that there were uh, supporters of Zionism who funded uh, the rise of the Nazi Party. That's pretty weird, you know. Maybe that's worth looking into. I'm not going to say what happened, right? Because as as scientific socialists, as communists, we're we're guided by truth wherever it takes us, right? Wherever uh, objective reality takes us, we study it and we change our decisions based on where that information takes us and. Um, I just find that really fascinating, you know, so. Absolutely. Um, that's sort of like why it feels like being in the twilight zone sometimes, uh, is what I say. If you do go down these rabbit holes, um, sometimes you try explaining it to people and it, you know, they get scared by it even, but yeah, you know, truth is truth still. And you can always, you know, bring people along slowly, um, you know, you don't have to hit them with all this information all at once, maybe. Um, I want to share this, too, uh, going back to what we were talking about with um, uh, with the evangelical Christians supporting Zionism. Because this is probably uh, Mike Pompeo is probably the most recent powerful example of that. Um, and I mean, this article is about it specifically. It says the rapture in the real world. Mike Pompeo blends beliefs and policy. Um, so literally bending, I mean, using his evangelical beliefs to, to craft um, U.S. policy. Trump said he wanted to be the most pro-Israel president ever. Um, Biden one-upped him by increasing funding to Israel $700,000. But uh, um, yeah, there you go. There's someone high up in the government using um, the evangelical faith to push for um, Zionism and weapons to Israel. Yeah, I just want Definitely. to add people who don't have JSTOR, um, Sci-Hub is a great resource for finding um, that article if you need it. Also, I just wanted to add, just on the topic what we were discussing a little bit ago, I thought about something. Um, is that like, I don't know about like the necessarily direct, com um, like the necessarily direct like connections between Zionists and the Nazi party. I don't really know about that, but um, I do know that like leaders like um, Chaim Weizmann and other like Zionist leaders were like perfectly willing to at least promote or ideas like anti-semitic ideas about jewish people like he would um send letters that he knew would be read by the british censor basically indicating that like jewish people had like greater power particularly around um world war one and that sort of stuff so yeah it's not something that i would consider like is like beyond the pale of what that might be done and yeah, I, it's such a difficult atmosphere for like the investigation of truth because even just questioning israel um at, at a political level you start to get dogpiled with claims of anti-semitism so you start to get deeper and deeper into it <laughs> and you can only yeah. imagine the things people are going to throw at you um but uh if if no one has any other questions with uh, regard to this topic i wanted to turn um towards the switch from propaganda to public relations because i think that is itself a propagandistic switch Right. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the times when people um, uh, engage with uh, Bernays ideas, they accepted them. But it was that word propaganda that kind of turned them off. So um, what do you how, how was that transition from propaganda to public relations affected? 
I think public relations, a lot of people define it as damage control or controlling a narrative and propaganda in itself, even in Spanish is not necessarily a bad term propaganda. Like if I'm going to have a party or an event or a birthday party, whatever, I'm going to say like in Spanish, I say, you know, voy a diseñar propaganda, right? Like I'm going to create propaganda to get people to, because you're pro, so you're trying to get, promote something for a certain end, right? And I think with public relations, we have to understand news media. And like, I, I studied journalism in college, and I just find it fascinating because in bourgeois academia journalism schools, they teach you be impartial, show both sides of the story, take no sides. But that's completely impossible, right? So it's possible to be objective, but not uh, uh, unbiased. And there's a difference. So to be objective, like I'm a, I can say I'm biased, right? As a communist, uh, I'm, I'm obviously pro-socialism, I'm anti-capitalist, but I can point out an objective fact or reality that the, you know, it's, it's 622 in LA where I'm speaking to you guys from, I can point out an objective reality that I'm wearing a white shirt, that uh, I have headphones on my head. You know, that is objective reality, regardless of your, in, your subjective bias, there's the objective truth, right? And even as communists, we all promote that, except for the postmodern uh, anarchist hi hippie types who are like, my truth, or truth is relative, whatever, but they don't even matter. Um, so, right, we, we, we recognize that, that there is objective truth, but in, in journalism school and in bourgeois media, they say that as a journalist, you shouldn't have a bias. As a journalist, you shouldn't have an opinion and, and this and that. But that's impossible because if you go to these newsrooms, and I've been in them before, all of these journalists went to elite schools. They come from elite families. They write for publications that are owned and created by multinational corporations, by oil companies, banking companies. So how are you going to eliminate if, if you, the people paying your bills are have these financial interests, you don't think that's going to impact you in any way? Like I used to, for example, I used to intern at a local newspaper in New York, in Queens. I'm not going to say the name just in case they they try to hit me up <laughs> with a subpoena. But I, uh, I was covering local news. So one of the interesting things about New York is that there's no Walmart in New York City. And one and and the, one of the reasons for that, I guess, is you know to maintain local business, small business, whatever, which is not bad, right? It's it's like obviously fuck Walmart, but uh, it's interesting though because one of the um, like I, I was publishing the, writing this article about that, and one of the sponsors of the of that newspaper, small newspaper, it was Walmart. Like they they brought advertisements in the newspaper. And so they like cut my story from the paper because it was on that topic. So like a lot of the bias that happens in bourgeois journalism and media is done through selection. And uh, Parenti has a, an amazing book on this, uh, you know, Inventing Reality. One of my favorite books, hands down. Uh, Chomsky's is all right. You know, he has, you know, his, his stuff is okay. Uh, Parenti, I think, has a better uh, analysis of it. But anyway, when it comes to public relations, it's really about damage control, framing a story and, and setting up a certain plot and scenario and characters and not looking beyond that story. And that's really what a lot of public relations uh, is really intended to do is to create. So like when we have 9-11, for example, a PR, somebody who's an expert at PR will say, you know, if you're doing PR for the U.S. government, like that is a stressful ass job, but you have to get creative. You know, it's like, OK. All right, guys. Uh, we need to go into the Middle East. We need to bomb. Uh, we need. We want Saddam's oil. We want uh, access to all these resources in the Middle East. How are we going to sell this? Right? How are you going to sell this product? Because whenever you're you're selling a product, you have to create a demand for it. And what are the best ways to create a demand for it? Is understanding human emotion, and human psychology, and one of the best ways to control people is through fear. Right? If you scare the crap out of people you you get a certain outcome and that's what happens with insurance by the way they, these are pr magicians when they're like do you have you know flood insurance like a flood can happen at any time you know and they'll, they'll come up with some random statistics and say you know you need flood insurance right now 
And, and a lot of these insurance companies function on that model through fear, uh, life insurance and all that. Um, and then, you know, PR also is about like creating uh, artificial uh, demand for something as well. Like when we see in particular, I think one of the, the biggest things as well, when we look at advertisements for certain products or commodities, like if you look at advertisements for beer or alcohol, you'll have like these like Chad dudes who are like all built and then they'll have like women around them and they'll have like alcohol and they make it seem like because they're drinking that alcoholic product that the women are around them and paying attention to them. Um, the, one of the biggest ones that scammed me is college and debt. I was always told growing up, go to college, go to college. Go. If you don't go to college, you're a failure. Even if you have to get into debt, do it. Right. And lo and behold, right now I'm, I'm working in construction. I'm, I'm actually an apprentice to become an electrician. I'm not even using my degrees right now um, because the, the fields that I studied were not really lucrative. Right. So it's, it's one of those things where it's like PR is about how do you sell something and create a narrative so that you create a false demand for it? But also, how do you do damage control? How do you distract? Like, you, you guys remember when Epstein killed himself, supposedly? And, and then, like, two weeks later, you know, what was it? Like, uh, a few weeks later, some news story came out and everybody just forgot about it, you know? So, uh, it's just, it's like also, I think this, this is also the role of mass media and social media, social media in parentheses and quotations. It's designed to lower our attention span. There's all these studies that come out about overstimulation and attention span. The attention span of the average Gen Zer is lower than the attention span of the millennial, lower than the attention span of the boomer, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So like our ability to focus in on one thing, study it properly, to give it attention is getting worse and worse and worse because we get bored with it easy and we're like, oh, I don't care about that anymore. What's next? You know, we're, let's scroll to the right or we, we, the TikTok. You guys had an amazing, uh, you know, content piece. It was like the TikTokization of, uh, what was it? Uh, it was like the TikTokization. What was it? It was like something like that. It was like the TikTokization of. It was a video um, Carlos did with Ewoks unhinged. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it was with B-Level, I think, yeah. And uh, it, I, I was like, damn, that's such a good way of putting it. Like, the TikTokization of the capitalist of, minds, of the capitalist yeah. world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, they're doing that where it's like, you guys remember 20, 20... I remember this clearly. 2013, 2014, every single day, Assad, chemical weapons, Assad, chemical weapons, Assad, chemical weapons, Assad, chemical... Weapons, Assad, chemical you know, everybody believed it. Everybody, everybody was like, "Oh, Syria, chemical weapons." So a few years later, all these reports come out. Yeah, it was complete bullshit. It was fake. But nobody has actually gone back to see. Oh shit! It turns out that that whole narrative was fake. But we've already moved on to something else. So we're bored with that. You know, so that has a tremendous impact on how we understand history, how we understand reality. And that 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 change that has an influence because now we're living in a society that's not guided and based on truth, but just on lies. We're building our li entire societies and structures and livelihoods based on lies that never happened and on illusions that can never be. You know, it's like the American dream, right? So it's like we, we this is public relations. It's at its finest. It's like how do you guide the the masses into a certain direction? Uh, and this, uh, this is why I highly suggest people check out Bernays' book, Crystallizing Public Opinion, where he basically talks about mass mind control and how public relations plays that role. Public relations is mass mind control. And this is like high level wizardry right there. I think that's fascinating because one of the one of the things this this whole switch towards uh, the TikTokization of thinking um is in line with the ends of propaganda because in order to fight back an order that's so complex and so ingrained in people's minds um, where it literally gets people whose fundamental interest is antagonistic to it to buy into it in order to fight back against that you need consciousness and that's what us as as a revolutionary vanguard that's what communists are there to do to to um, take the revolutionary consciousness to the masses to educate them but that takes a while right that that takes this concrete investigation of the world that 
um, is not is not very easy. And uh, before that, it was that the American masses were kept ignorant just because of the information that they had available to them. Now they're literally breaking down the sort of cognitive apparatuses that can even allow them to have the potential to study the things necessary in order to change their mind. Like most working people in the U.S. are not reading. Like they, they just don't mm. read. There's the attention span to read. It's just not there. And that wasn't the case 40, 50 years ago, right? They were reading bad stuff and they were kept ignorant by bourgeois media. Um, but today they can't even read, period. Um, and I'm sorry to break it to you, but you have to read, you have to engage, you have to educate yourself. And that's part of the socialist project, not just to achieve, you know, the, the revolution, but socialist construction is about lifting the cultural life of people, right? If you look at what China, the USSR, what Cuba, all of these socialist countries, what they've been able to do is a tremendous lifting of the cultural life of the masses so that this dichotomy that exists in class society between alta cultura and cultura popular, between high culture and popular culture, it's, it's merged. There's a synthesis where high culture becomes popular culture. And that the potential for doing that has been basically not fully erased. Obviously, there's hope, but it's been made so much more difficult by creating people whose um, who's, who's ability to think is, uh, is, is breaks off every one minute because that's how they're used to thinking, according to TikToks and, and their, their um, ability to concentrate. And it's getting worse with kids. You look at um, the show Pocoyo. Or, or I don't know what the <laughs> um, poco year or something like that. It's it's a it's a popular kids show now, um, but it's it's amongst the amongst the 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 little kids shows. It's the one that cuts off scenes the quickest. So like every three jump seconds, jump cuts. Yes, it's constant jump cuts, and it's it's almost like preparing these kids to be ingrained to not have an attention span, and that's like an even deeper form of uh, propaganda. Right. It's 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 changing the structures of thinking to the point where even thinking against is too hard. It's beyond the limits of, of what they have sort of structured people to be able to think. Now, yeah, remember, that's when such those, a great point. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. I, I just yeah, remember yeah. When those jump cuts started becoming a thing and YouTube became like what all the kids watch. And now mm -hmm. it's just the dumbest fucking content like Jake Paul. <laughs> You know, yeah. and then you had Vine came along, and yeah, they it got shortened got up shortened even up more. more. And it's ridiculous. I mean, I I don't even use the the app that I post on the most because I don't I don't like going yeah. on TikTok anymore because it just shortens your attention span so much. Yeah, and no, I think well, one thing that um, I think I kind of what we just kind of got is that there are like a whole bunch of like different possible sources for people. So like get from, but I think an interesting point that Bernays makes and Prenny makes it in Inventing Reality is how like all those like a lot of those sorts, especially journalists, like they depend on like proximity to people in power. Like so that's like kind of like the constant source of Bernays has a quote where he says, it's a little long, but I'll read it real quick. One reason perhaps why the politician today is slow to take up methods which are commonplace in business life is that he has such ready entry to the media of communication on which his power depends. The newspaper man looks to him for news, and by his power of giving or withholding information, the politician can often effectively censor political news. But being dependent every day of the year and for year after year upon certain politicians for news, the newspaper reporters are obliged to work in harmony with their news sources. I think that's like a very interesting point and something that like consistently we see it today um, as well. That's that's lapdog media. I remember Eddie and I had a professor who we talk about a lot. He was very formative for both of us. Um, but he was a communist. He is a he's still alive. <laughs> he's not dead. Um, but he, he he's a communist. He studied in China, and he would have us do these assignments where he would give us two lists of like the mainstream sources and alternative sources, um, and we were forced to look at like three of each in order to then present the news. Um, but um, one of the things that uh, that uh, he always emphasized was the Jesus. Um, it was connected to Alex's point, and now it's slipping. Maybe proximity could... or like sources. Oh, sources the, the right. distinction between lapdog um, and guard dog media, right? That media is supposed to be the guard dog of the politicians. They're supposed to be on the lookout constantly for what is it that they're doing, that's that they're sneaking around. How how are they collaborating with each other um, to shape politics and in undemocratic ways? And instead, what the media has become is essentially a lapdog. And that quote that you um, just read, Alex, it it hits right into that. 
I think uh, you guys have also hit on a, a really important point where when we talk about propaganda, mind control, it's not just about false information. It's not just about misinformation and disinformation, but it's also about subversion, making you dumber. I remember watching a TV show. I can't remember exactly what show it was, but I, I always remember this one scene where the parents in the show, they wanted to do, they wanted to like watch a movie or something or do like adult. It wasn't sex, but it was like, they wanted to do something that they could only do before they had kids. So the parents were like, oh, um, let's just give the kids a Robitussin and sing them a lullaby and put them to sleep. And then we can do that. And that's how I kind of view how the elites view us. We're like, they give us our Robitussin. They give us our little, uh, you know, our um, coping mechanisms, like Friday nights and and, club. and I've been there. Guy. I say this not as like a Puritan. Like I've been that guy where I live for Friday night. I live for getting fucked up and, and going to the club and forgetting about all my problems. Um, but they kind of have, have us pacified and dumbed down so that we don't see the bigger picture. They, they make our attention span shorter. They lower the vibration of music. I had a, a great conversation with, with somebody recently about uh, Islam and music. And one of the things that I find fascinating is that uh, one of the Zionist talking point propagandas is that, oh, Muslims uh, hate music. They're against music. So they're against culture and art. And it's a complete subversion and lie. That's not true. If you look at the Hadiths, if you look at the Islamic commentary on music, it's not that Muslims are against music. It's that they're against the power of music because they recognize that music is is very magical music it taps into these sounds that you create through an instrument or in your laptop or whatever they literally create emotion they make you feel a certain vibration they tap into certain frequencies and you can control masses like if you go to a concert you know if everybody's singing the same lyric uh, it, it can be part. It's kind of like when you go to a protest, like if you guys have ever been to a protest and everybody's like in the same wave. Like I remember uh, I went to one protest and we were all like on the same wavelength, you know, and, and, and it felt amazing, electrifying, like the hairs on my arm started uh, going up. Like I felt like a literal current going through me. But you see that these uh, artists tap into that, like Drake uh, and all these. Yeah, exactly. Like the, the Muslims, they are so aware of this. Um, in their commentary where they say, look, Western media and propaganda, they know the power of music where you could get some idiot like Drake or fucking Lil whatever. And they're, they're saying the most, the dumbest, the dumbest crap. And you have people, millions of people remembering all of these lyrics, singing them together in the concert. And, and, and they feel this false sense of unity and like this false sense of togetherness. Uh, but it's such a, 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 a low vibrational, low frequency, a connection you know and it's like what so then th they tap in music and media is so powerful uh even this one guy uh, i i suggest you guys all check him out his name is uh, leor cohen l-y-o-r cohen uh big time he's uh, a u.s record executive entrepreneur uh this guy has been involved with some of the biggest hip-hop uh, labels he's a very big uh, music executive warner music group def jam um and even going back to Death Row Records, a lot of the hip hop industry, in particular in the 80s, was completely subverted by Israeli intelligence. There is so much information. Yeah, Lee R. Cohen, this guy's like a billionaire. He's like a Zion. So he's like, look, like he doesn't look like he's involved in the hip hop and, and, and industry, but he runs a lot of the stuff, you know? And, and there's all these interviews where rappers who want to be more politically conscious want to speak out against capitalism, against all this stuff um, where they'll lose their contracts and, and deals with these record labels. Once they start getting to, you know, that's why uh, there's also even an interview um, with dead Prez where they talk about Lear Cohen and his control over music industry. Uh, and this is why this is one of the, the methods of manipulation, propaganda, mind control is subverting the power of music even uh, Victor Hara has a beautiful quote about that. Like music is like a powerful tool and it can be used to like build revol like entire revolutions have, especially, uh, you know, Carlos says, you know, like in Latin America and the Caribbean, like 
music has played such a role in our revolutions. But now that's why they're putting out people like Bad Bunny. That's why they're putting out people like um what's this fucking name? residente like these controlled we're like oh he's so woke he's so prick but then he's moving people in a in a, such a whack liberal direction so that's all of this to say that music is one of the the core elements of propaganda mind control and the elites even tupac himself there's there's a jerry rubin i think his name was who was like an, an israeli intelligence asset and Death Row Records was infiltrated by the FBI and, and Mossad. Like that whole Tupac came from a very revolutionary tradition. You know, his mother was a Panther. He was uh, Matulu Shakur, who's a, an amazing doctor, a communist, a Pan Africanist from the Bronx, who did acupuncture, promoted clean living and, and healthy living. Uh, you know, he was uh, involved in Tupac's life. Eventually, you had Death Row Records, uh, Suge Knight, all these people who were put in to redirect Tupac back into those songs of like, fuck this and, and bitches and the, and cause you know, he, they, they kind of, and they promoted drug use, they promoted alcohol. This is all documented. I actually had a conversation with, uh, uh, uh John Potash, the author of uh, drugs as weapons against us, a great book, highly suggest you guys check that out. Uh, John is a, a really, a really great guy. Uh, it's, it's fascinating, dude. It's everywhere. The, the music industry is a big part of it too. That's interesting. I saw a video the other day where it was like Tupac um, before. I think it was making a joke like Tupac before and after having his heart broken. But he was like, women need to be respected. Women do all this domestic labor that they don't get paid for. And, you know, we'd be calling them bitches and it's disrespectful. And then, you know, it flashes to his music years later. And like you said, he's calling women bitches and talking about having sex with a million girl or what, whatever, you know, rapper like mainstream rappers talk about. Um, it's interesting. I also hear people like this rapper I brought up when you were talking, Nav, like people, critics in the rap industry don't know how this guy has a career. They're like, it's just like the most bland, monotone rapping of the lyrics we've heard 8 million times. But, you know, the industry so heavily controlled and, you know, they basically just brought this guy to LA and and gave him a, a golden ticket in the rap industry. Um, Cause he does that kind of bland, you know, stereotypical music that they can play on the radio. Um, but it's interesting to hear the, you know, the sort of sinister, um, I don't know, beginnings behind it. Yeah, for sure. I'm trying to find that interview that you did um, I'm not finding it now, but I wanted to bring up a quote here um, that I find interesting because um, one of the things we were on your podcast last week and um, you brought up a video on Bernays, an infographic, and it was really helpful. And one of the things that kept on coming to mind was like, is there anything in here that like socialists could use? You get me? Because um, Lenin is constantly talking about, you know, the role of propaganda and agitation and, and when to use what. Um, and there's this quote that I wanted to, uh, bring up, uh, where he's talking about, um, he's talking about here, the masses, uh, he says, but instead of a mind, universal literacy has given the common man a rubber stamp, a rubber stamped inked with advertising slogans, with editorials, with published scientific data, with trivialities of tabloids and the profundities of history, but quite innocent of original thought. Each man's rubber stamp is the twin of 2 million others. So that when these millions are exposed to the same stimuli, all receive identical imprints. The amazing readiness with which large masses accept this process is probably accounted for by the fact that no attempt is made to convince them that black is white. Instead, their preconceived hazy ideas that a certain gray is almost black or almost white are brought into sharper focus. Their prejudices, notions, and convictions are used as a starting point with the result that they are drawn by a thread into passionate adherence to a given mental picture. And those last two sentences, right? They're preconceived hazy ideas that a certain gray is almost black. That's how Antonio Gramsci uh, tells us that we have to craft counter hegemony. You have to go to the masses that have this incoherent world outlook that's fragmentary, and you have to find the kernels 
which are ambiguous enough that you can then rearticulate them away from the existing order and towards socialism. And he's talking there, uh, Bernays, about passions and, and desires. And it's this rearticulation is not just about reason, it's also about emotion, right? And that involves in the process, you know, art, right? You need revolutionary art in order to have a revolutionary um, movement, right? Every major revolution has had revolutionary art. Um, so how do you see the relationship of how communists studying um, Bernays should approach his work? Is there anything that we can learn and readjust for the communist movement? Because the way that I've tried to think about this is that, you know, whereas they use propaganda to keep the masses asleep, we can use propaganda to wake them up. We can use propaganda as a way to help people gain autonomy, right? And, 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 and have a different form of leadership. There's this comment that Gramsci makes before he goes to prison about discipline. And he says, bourgeois discipline is about uh, people just following blindly. Socialist uh, discipline is about a conscious following that in following, there's also a sense of freedom. So how, how do you think that we should relate to Bernays' work? How should we think of propaganda? Is there anything to learn and to incorporate? And if so, does it have to be adjusted? So, yeah. That's a <clears throat> wonderful question. And I think part of it is exactly what Eddie was mentioning earlier, is using TikTok as a tool and not being a slave to it. Posting, con I think that's brilliant. Like posting content and getting it out there, but not succumbing to it and not being a safe to it to get people out of that right because the goal is to not keep to not to keep people in tiktok but to get them out of it because that's where they are now go to where the masses are and bring them from there to where you want them to go and i think that one of the important things going back to what we were mentioning earlier about the difference between being objective and being unbiased is that we can point out Edward Bernays and Sigmund Freud, even though they were creeps, they were fucking weirdos, they were, you know, scumbags, they understood an objective reality that the human being is comprised of both spiritual and higher level desires and material, carnal, lower level desires. And we can either follow the former and live a life of righteousness, live a life of purpose and principles and morality, or we can be a slave to our appetites and just chase alcohol, chase drugs, chase women, <clears throat> chase parties. And every human being has that contradiction within ourselves of like the animalistic side of us and the spiritual higher purpose side. And th this is what I really enjoyed about the works of Ernesto Che Guevara, especially his diaries, where Che Guevara is just, he's just like a, a regular guy. Like he, he's, you know, like he sees, he's, there's moments, especially in his diary, like people are kind of off put by it because, you know, when we think of Che, we think of like his final version of like being this like amazing upright revolutionary, which he was being like this guy who was so principled and gave up everything to, for the cause but he wasn't always like that. He had a transformation. He had to move and transcend from his lower vibrational. This is why, like, even again, I, I'm not religious, but an interesting uh, relation to when they talk about chakras, right? How we have seven chakras. You have your root chakra, which is like lower in your body. So people who are ruled by like the little head and not the big head, right? And then you have your, your first chakra, which is like your third eye. And that when when you open your third eye is when you achieve consciousness and, and you can, even if you want to sleep with this woman, woman or you want to consume this alcohol or drug, you have a higher purpose and a higher vision and a higher morality that you live by. And so you're not going to succumb to that. Uh, Ernesto Che Guevara went through that process as well. You know, and he, he talks about this in his diaries. Like even when he was in Cuba, he was married to... Um, I forgot her name, but she was like a Peruvian uh, woman who was like his comrade. But then he was in, in Cuba and he met this other woman and he was like, oh, man, you know, like and, and, he, and he he talks about this openly. Everybody goes through this. If any guy tells you he doesn't go through that, he's lying. You know, we all go through this. So it's like understanding that, you know, and, and this is, again, uh, the above and the below. Right. The above being higher purpose, meaning 
the below being, you know, ego, love, the, the seven deadly sins that, that we can talk about, lust, pride, uh, materialism. Edward Bernays, as a magician, instead of elevating people up toward higher consciousness, he tapped into that and brought them down. How, how do I get these people to consume products? How do I get these people to become over-sexualized, commodified, commercialized, to support war, to support invasions, to support usury and debt and all these horrible things? And so our job as communists is A, to recognize this objective reality that, yeah, as human beings, we all have, we're all contradictions. We all have parts of us that just want to chill on a Friday and watch Family Guy. And there's parts of us that want to read a fucking 800 page capital and, you know, and organize the movement and the masses. And how do we get people in a, how do we become realistic about it and elevate people's consciousness to a point where they're fighting for a higher principle, a higher uh, morality. And I think that, uh, I think what we can take from Bernays as communist, a scientific socialist uh, is understanding the processes, the psychological processes that lead people to make certain decisions and just being honestly, I think what it really comes down to is studying more and learning. Like even Lenin talks about this, like just asking people, like, why do you like this art? Like not just judging people and being like, I, I could be kind of judgy too. I'm not gonna lie. But like, like, why do you like bad bunny? Like I, I have this conversation all the time with people where they're like, Oh, like, Oh, bad bunny. Like he's so, Instead of me being a dick and being like, oh, like Bad Bunny's whack, which whatever he is, but I can be like, what is it about Bad Bunny in particular that you like? Is it like, and then how do we learn from that and then apply it to communism? And this is why on my channel, I'm not those, a lot of communist channels are very scared to even talk about quote unquote conspiracy theories and to talk about these things like how we're talking about now. They're very scared of it. And a lot of these channels are very boring, by the way. They're just like, this is our declaration and, and point of view and political line. And it's like, who who wants to, like this conversation, more people are, are are watching this now because we're talking the way everybody else talks. Like, especially after COVID, a lot of people are like, huh, what's going on? You know, like there's some stuff going on 9-11. Why, instead of shying away from it and being scared to touch on certain topics, Bad Bunny is a reggaeton artist who is basically... He's supposed to be like a woke, you know, revolutionary artist, but he's super commercialized. But anyway, um, I feel like our job as communists is to learn, learn what the masses are talking about. Right. Like even if you have that one libertarian right wing Trumper friend who's like China, man, China released the virus and the, the wet markets. And don't just like scoff at him and be like, oh, th look at this fucking idiot. Because then it just reinforces that narrative of like the arrogant, like Marxist, liberal, you know, intellectual, be like, well, oh, that's interesting. You know, you think that, I think it happens to be this, this and that, you know, like, like look into the, you know, just like humility, learn, listen and learn from people, L listen to what people say, learn from what people say and, and, and always bring people back to, to the communist uh, ma dialectical materialist outlook. Uh, because once we give, we what we want to do we don't want to give people a dry set of beliefs and be like okay you have to believe this we want to give people a methodology a way of understanding the universe so that they can understand things on their own right so that they can be like huh follow the money right that's part of what marxism is about follow the material conditions what create so that they can do that you know so i think that's really what it comes down to definitely I, one of my best buddies actually my wrestling partner in college is into the conspiracy rabbit hole and he'll send me stuff about like the government controlling the weather and you know i kind of used to laugh at it but now i just kind of try and entertain him and see where he's coming from and you know usually he's not as far off as you'd think um and like when cuba uh had the recent thing where their oil tanks got struck by lightning i sent it to him and i was like baby it's the weather control machine like <laughs> trying to inch him towards communism yeah um, operation popeye <laughs> right <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's a real thing if you look it up um and yeah then i started realizing like oh you know there's more evidence to this weather control thing than um than i thought at first and um yeah, people who are open to conspiracies are more than likely open to uh, communism. Yeah. I used to have a, one of my old kitchen managers used to always 
come up, like the one uh, back when I lived in Savannah, I uh, used to come up to me and always be telling me about conspiracy theories. A couple of times he tried to tell me about Morgellons disease, which I'm not sure what that is, but it was interesting. But yeah, you can't like, I don't know. My, like I worked in kitchens in Savannah for like a long time and the majority of people I worked with were generally going to be more conservative people. And I don't know, you can't be an asshole <laughs> at one point in time. It's like, uh, yeah, the don't be an asshole thing. You got to just kind of like try and redirect the thinking. And that's why like I'm really reading a lot of pa- Paulo Ferry. I think that's, I'm pretty sure that's how you pronounce his name. But I've been reading a lot about him um, recently and he's like one of my favorites. And I think it's just, like a lot of good insights on trying to like, you, you have to like make people realize you can't like, you know, drag people by the nose to like these realizations. You kind of have to like talk to them, pose questions to them and like get them to like come to those conclusions themselves and realize that, you know, the world isn't like static and it's not like w- w- the way we have the world to now is like predestined. It's something that like people can change. And yeah. Absolutely. And it also comes with the fact that, you know, when when you engage in, in these types of vanguard activities you're functioning as a teacher right and you're the the relationship between teacher and student is not unilateral it's not just there's the one that learns and the one that teaches it's a dialectical relationship and it's one of the things i've been teaching now for almost three years and that's the biggest shock to me i wasn't like when i go into class i wasn't expecting before i ever did it for the first time to learn but one of the biggest things you realize is that holy shit i'm learning more than like when i read on my own um so that process of teaching and of talking to someone and and asking questions it's a very socratic process it's a process of socratic questioning it's helpful it's not condescending and you also learn in the process i think that's a a beautiful way to put it we are always students and this is why i tell other communists never stop reading and learning and don't only read communist stuff that i think this is a big problem that happens because a lot of times people will get into communism marxism and they'll read everything they'll read lenin stalin mao like and that's good read that you know and and understand it but don't try to diversify your diet it's kind of like if you're trying to get healthier as a human being and and eat more nutrition you're not just going to eat meat like every meal every day throw in some grapes, throw in some carrots, throw in, you know, it's like, I try to diversify my reading diet as much as I can. Lately, I've been reading a lot of theology. I have been finding it really fascinating. Uh, I've, I try to read as much history as I can. I try to uh, even, uh, you know, I'm in an electrical apprenticeship program. I read more technical books about how electricity works and the theory behind it. And just read and study everything. The, the real communist. And this is what Lenin says in his the tasks of the the Young Communist League when they established the Young Communist League in the uh, the Soviet Union. He says, you know, if I had to say one word that sums up the task of the Young Communist, it is to learn, learn everything, even if it doesn't, even if it seems crazy, even if it seems like not related. Because it's not just about reading communist. Oh, I'm a communist. I'm only going to read communist shit. I'm only going to talk to communists. I'm only going to listen to. No, it doesn't work like that. You know, if you want to be a, a good communist, you have to read and study everything, and even be able to argue the positions of your opponent better than they do. Look at what Marx and Lenin. Most, if you actually, it's it's interesting because if you read Marx and Lenin, most of their writing is actually responding to right wingers and, and and people who have a different perspective they understand that their argument better than they do you know and and i think that's really what it comes down to and i think uh something that you guys tapped into earlier that is very important is like with a lot of the people who are more conspiratorial minded okay maybe they have incorrect ideas but at least they're on the right path right where it's like they're questioning stuff they're asking questions and, and just be able to be like, oh, okay, you believe that. Well, isn't it interesting that X, Y, Z, that the CIA tried to, you know, bomb uh, Miami and blame it on Cuba, right? And, and blame it on Fidel. That's pretty interesting too. And then by there, like, if you're just cool about it like that, you're going to win people over. But if you're like, no, 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 like if you're just like an asshole, like you're going to push people away. And, and I think humility is an important part of that. And it's like, even when you think you know something and you think you know something in its totality, 
you are just getting to the beginning. It's like a spiral staircase that keeps going and going. And this is why the uh, the, the prefix uh, des. So when we say to decimate something, right? When we say we're going to decimate something, the prefix dec des is 10. And this is the decimal system. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. But the way the decimal system works, like it's kind of like if you're reading Marx, Lenin, Mao, and all that, you're like 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9. And then what? once you think you're 0 0.9, you think you know everything. But it's not until you get to 1.0 to the next decimal point that you can understand something in its totality. But then you realize that that one is just one tenth of an even higher level of knowledge, you know? So it just, it keeps going and going. You're never going to understand everything in its totality. Uh, we're always going to have to keep learning. We're always going to have to keep studying and we're never going to know everything in its totality, which is impossible because everything is constantly expanding and growing and moving. But we have to have that mentality where we have to study everything, read everything, listen to everybody. Uh, don't necessarily believe everybody, but listen to everybody and just be able to understand where people are coming from. And that's that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of learning, right? Um, if if you could get to that point where you knew everything, you know, at 20 years old, 25 years old, 30 years old, what the hell are you going to do for the next 40, 50 years? <laughs> it's going to be a boring 40, 50 years, right? Yeah. So um, part of the part of the reason why you come to love learning is because the more you learn, the more you realize there, how much more there is to learn, right? And I, I think this happens to everyone who reads, which is that after every book book you read, you find five, six more that you haven't yet and that you want to read. So quite literally, right? The more you learn, the more you realize how much left there is to learn. Um, but I wanted to, to give a joke. You mentioned that wonderful speech that given uh, that Lenin gives to the Youth League where he concludes with learn. Um, there's this old Soviet joke um, where they ask Marx, I've, I think I've said it before, but <laughs> they ask uh, Marx whether he prefers to go with uh, his wife or his mistress. And Marx was more of a conservative fellow. So he says, I'm, I'm going to go with the wife. They ask Engels and Engels was a bit more liberal. He says, I'm going to go with the mistress. They ask Lenin and Lenin says, I'm going to tell the mistress I'm going with the wife, the wife I'm going with the mistress, and I'm going actually to the library to study, study, study. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how much he emphasized learning, right? And if you look at what the Soviet Union was able to create, the country where 40% of the books being published in the world were published out of the Soviet Union, each uh, the average working class family was subscribed to like four journals. Uh, workers had personal libraries at home. The cultural life was just completely higher. The amount of the percentage of people that were going to like theater, to museums, they quite literally elevated the cultural life like no other nation has seen in the history of humanity. So today, the you know, these tendencies that pop up from the internet that are like anti-reading theory or something like that. Yeah. Like, you know, I don't want to say they're ops, but because it's very easy to get to that position out of laziness, right? It's a, the same thing that happens with, with sometimes with uh, Marx scholarship where People would be like, yeah, the essence of Marxism is that, you know, 29 page document he never published that he wrote when he, in 1843 when he was 26. It's like, no, it's not. <laughs> You're just being lazy. Um, so it, it's, you know, learning is beautiful. And one of the toughest things that you find as, as people raised in the society that, you know, education is for profit, everything's for profit, is that uh, the places you go to learn, you don't actually learn. I didn't fall in love with learning until way, way after. And when I did it, it was on my own. It was the readings that I would do on my own away from school. And I, I think that's something very special and that that's at the core of the communist process. We have today in the left, this sort of jerk reaction to any sort of ethical language. Like we have to transform ourselves ethically, strive towards virtue, strive towards learning more and constantly improving ourselves. And there's this jerk reaction against it. And in part, it's understandable, right? It's, it's the liberals who in the face of questions of exploitation, climate change, whatever it be, they're the ones that are just say, you know, and just buy green or recycle or, or they reduce it to individual, they reduce systemic problems and, and what are supposed to be systemic solutions to individual activities. But as dialectical materialists, we see everything is integrated with everything else. Everything is interconnected. 
And we realize that what it is to be human is to be a unique expression of an ensemble of relations. So that ethical transformation that we're making in our personal life is not divided from the, politi from the political, is not divided from the community. Gramsci introduces this concept of the ethical political. And I think that's how we should think about it, right? We, we, when we are involved in a revolutionary process, we're also revolutionizing ourselves as individuals. We should be crafting, you know, what Che considered the socialist man or the socialist woman, the socialist person in the process of struggling for socialism. And that's how you lead by example, right? Um, not by, you know, uh, looking down on people condescendingly and telling them, oh, you're not enlightened, you're not as good. It's by leading by example that people begin <laughs> to emulate you. It's like what our friend Brock says. He's a you know huge organizer helping me start the CPUSA chapter in my area. Um, but he likes reading Jordan Peterson's 10 Rules for Life. I mean, he's one of those guys who will just read like anything. Um, he loves to read non-communist liter literature and communist literature. And he likes it because it's like he likes the self-help aspect of it. Um, and it's like that's something we're missing from the left, the uh, you know, desire to improve ourselves, which is something that every, you know, a uh, revolutionary leader wrote about is like forging yourself in the struggle, you know, becoming a better socialist and revolutionary through engaging in class struggle. Um, but it's getting a little late. So I think we should probably yeah. wrap it up. It's been a great stream, but um, thank you so much, Ramiro. Um, anyone? Thank you guys. You guys are awesome. This is one of my favorite yeah. streams. I learned a ton and I wrote down a ton of shit to, look up afterward. <laughs> I really appreciate you coming on, brother. And again, please check out Ramiro's channel, um, Ramiro Sebastian Funes. Um, we'll link, we have it linked actually to the description of the video so you can click on it. Please subscribe. It's again, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's my favorite channel to watch on YouTube, Unmasking Imperialism. I try to catch it live as often as I can, but I, I'm pretty sure I've watched basically every episode. So it's wonderful. <laughs> please, please subscribe to Ramiro and thanks again for coming on, brother. Thanks, guys. I uh, appreciate uh, you guys having me on. Uh, shout out to Midwest Remarks. You guys are awesome. Keep doing what you're doing. And we'll talk soon. We'll have some more episodes. This is just the beginning. Uh, we have so much to talk about. I could talk to you guys for hours. So thank like you guys this. so much. Have a good night, guys. Take care. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.